Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Nice to see you again, Tom. How are you today? I'm okay. So I understand that um, since I was seeing you um, that while ago, uh, that you ha you're in hospital again. Yeah. So can you tell me a bit more about what happened before that? Um, well, it was a few months ago now. Um, yeah, I'd done quite well for a number of years. Sort of kept it um, under control, really, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, I've not, I've not seen you since your gap year, wasn't it? Yeah, so that was four years ago. Um, and so, yeah, it was quite disappointing to, to go through it all again. Uh, but it sort of started um, at the, uh, towards the end of university. Um, mm -hmm. So I was doing law. And, uh, well, I was on course um, for a first, and I was just coming up to my... Uh, my final exams, mm -hmm. and I had a few essays and a few exams, and uh, so I just, I started working really hard, I felt like, right, now is the real time to um, put the effort in and to, to put the work in, so mm -hmm. I started to step a bit later, um, take on a bit more work, um, so my stress levels sort of start to increase um, over a while, I... Uh, I was drinking a lot more coffee, took a few uh, caffeine tablets, um, and energy drinks, a few people, well, because sort of the environment at the time was a lot of people were pushing themselves that they wouldn't normally uh, mm -hmm. do, and some people were taking Ritalin. Um, oh, wow, okay. Yeah, which... Um, Did you take any Ritalin? Yeah, um, because it was just like, it was, it, that was necessary at the time, and... Uh, how did that affect you? Well, I it sort of increased my confidence at the time. All, all the, everything that was going on, I was becoming a lot more productive. Um, yeah, a lot more confident. A lot mm -hmm. um, I was working harder. My brain was working faster, and so I yeah, my me my momentum was building up and up um, throughout the period. Um, yeah, and so I was, I was relishing it, and I was, um, yeah, doing a lot of work. And uh, so, what and did that mean to you then, to be at that time? Because it sounds like you put quite a lot of pressure on yourself. You've been doing really well at uni, and and you know this was it. This was the time. What did it mean to you to be feeling like that kind of more awake and um, more energized, maybe? Yeah, well, for me, it was, it was my sort of time. So I'd spent I'd spent three years I'd I was in control I was doing well I didn't I, it wasn't really part of my life at, at the time I didn't really talk to any of my friends about it um, but then I yeah I started to just sort of grow into it um, and I took the opportunity to. Yeah, enjoy this time. Um, and it's, it didn't really reach its peak until after my exams. I was, was still... Um, I was still functioning um, throughout my exams. Um, I, mm -hmm. I have since found out that um, I didn't get the results that I, that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, Why do you think that was? Um, 
But then I thought that I was working harder than ever, but uh, I, it was misjudged, I think. And so I, uh, yeah, I didn't perform to the best of my ability um, in like, when it came to the to the exams, and so I, I didn't achieve I didn't achieve a first tie. Um, only got two on. Um, what else was happening for you around that time? I mean, you talked about the pressure of your exams and staying up for them. Was anything else going on for you um, around the same time? Well, so it was the end of the end of university, and that was the time where, well, as soon as that period stopped of work, then I was sort of let off the leash mm-hmm. um, a bit. And, yeah, I just sort of to, to grow uh, even further. Um, so I, I, I mentioned I was, um, I was taking uh, Ritalin, drinking a lot of coffee, and as, as soon as that like, exam was... I'd stopped, I just, substance abuse sort of took a bit um, okay. more of a hold. Um, and yeah, I just sort of grew into this person who I thought was him, was um, the guy that everyone wanted to, to be around and to see. And so I made sure that I was just everywhere look to be seen I was yeah um, so this is like the the gap after you finish the exams but before the results are out yeah those yeah, kind yeah, of few yeah. weeks um so we were just going out a lot but if not every night um you said that you were taking Ritalin and drinking a lot of coffee yeah um and um using other drugs as well yeah it sort of developed into um cocaine a lot of cocaine um MDMA um Mm-hmm. MCAT. Uh, and how did they affect you? I honestly was on cloud nine at the time. Um, yeah, I. Uh, um, and so in this sort of role as the man, as the man about town, I was spent a lot on. Yeah, alcohol, drugs, clothes. Um, I invested in this technology. Um, well, having not had to deal with um, my illness throughout university and for it not being a part of that world, I I didn't confront those symptoms in a in a way that's gonna have long term sort of stability. Um as far, well it began with doing the work that I needed to do. That's just in, that's just what I needed to do in order to achieve my goals and to achieve what I want to. And then it just I just let it take hold. And I Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Brandon McNally. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes.
Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Have seated. May I know your problem? Well, I'm a patient with hypertension, chronic intermittent bipedal edema, and recurrent leg venous ulcers. I had a vascular surgery for non-healing right ankle stasis ulcer. I have a serious concern today that I had a low-grade fever of 100.2 early this morning. Otherwise, everything was well. The thing is, I was not even aware of the fever. I do have some ankle pain, worse on the right than the left. Okay. What's your age? Fifty-two, Doctor. Do you drink or smoke? No, Doctor. Are you getting nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea? No, Doctor. May I know your previous illness history? Well, hypertension, exploratory laparotomy in 2016 for abdominal obstruction, cholecystectomy in 2017, chronic intermittent bipedal edema, venous insufficiency, chronic recurrent stasis ulcers. What medications are you taking? Primaxin, daptomycin, clonidine, furosemide, potassium chloride, lisinopril, metoprolol, renitidine, colase, amlodipine, zinc sulfate, lortab, multivitamins with minerals. Are you allergic to any medicine? No, doctor. Well, the physical examination shows heart rate seventy-three, respiratory rate twenty. Blood pressure one hundred and four over sixty-seven, temperature ninety-eight point three, and oxygen saturation ninety-two percent on room air. There is hyperpigmentation involving distal calf on both legs. There is an open wound on the right medial malleolar area, measuring nine by five centimeters, with minimal serous drainage. Peri wound is hyperpigmentated. With a hint of erythema extending proximally to the medial aspect, distal third of the right lower leg, there is warmth but minimal tenderness on palpation of this area. There is also a wound on the right lateral malleolar area, measuring four by three centimeters. Another open wound on the left medial malleolar area, measuring seven by four centimeters. Wound edges are poorly defined. Laboratory results show white blood cell count is five point eight, with sixty four percent neutrophils, H and H eleven point three over thirty three point eight, and platelet count one hundred and seventy six thousand, BUN and creatine nine point two over zero point five two, albumin three point six, AST twenty five, ALT nine, ALKFOS eighty seven. And total bilirubin zero point six. Chest X-ray shows chronic bibascular subsegmental atelic stasis, likely related to elevated hemidiaphragm, secondary to chronic ileus. No absolute findings. You have multiple previous wound cultures, positive for pseudomonas, enterococcus, and stenotrophomonas, fevers, right leg, ankle, cellulitis. Chronic recurrent bilateral ankle venous ulcers, hypertension. I am ordering two sets of blood cultures, injection with daptomycin and primaxin four. I am ordering an MRI of the right ankle to check for underlying osteomyelitis. Follow up results of wound cultures. Additional treatment and medications are upon follow up. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a doctor briefing his colleague about a patient. Now read the question.
Have you got a list of all the patients and locations? Yeah. Who is our sickest patient? Mr. Marcel is the sickest patient. He is a 36-year-old male with a ruptured appendix awaiting OR. He became sick over the last 48 hours with worsening abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. We gave him fluids and brought antibiotics. Which antibiotics and how much fluid? Piptazo with 2 liters of normal saline so far. Imaging showed a ruptured appendix with free air under the diaphragm. I would keep a close eye on him. Have you drawn blood cultures? Yes. But they were drawn about an hour after antibiotics were started. And what are the plans if there is a delay in surgery? I haven't spoken to ICU yet, but he might need to go there if his condition worsens while he is waiting for the OR. Sound good? Yeah. I'll speak to ICU as soon as we're done here. Question 26. You hear part of a surgical team's briefing. Now read the question. She currently only has intermittent late decelerations, and these have improved with her position changes and supplemental oxygen. We'll monitor her until she's fully dilated and allow her to push. If there's any evidence of fetal distress or persistent late decelerations, we should be prepared to go to C-section. I've alerted the or to be prepared in case we need to use them. Great, I'll discuss this plan with Mrs. Aldrich, and we are done here. What are her vitals right now? Normal. I just checked 15 minutes ago. She had no late decelerations since you were called. Let's continue to monitor her. I need to know when she's complete and pushing so we can keep a close eye on her second stage. Question 27. You hear a radiologist talking about a new initiative that has been introduced. Now read the question. This is a big, ambitious project. We're going to focus on patient flow through the system right from the very start. When a patient sees their commission and they require support from radiology with imaging and they make a request. We want to get that request from imaging as quickly and as efficiently through the system to the reports available to the commission, so they can make the appropriate management plan and take the patient's clinical journey forwards. This is an ideal opportunity now to really embed some forward behavior, where we're learning together, we're developing together, we're looking at creating where we have today's work completed today that there's no delay so we're really improving the services to our patients. We are all taking control, we are all involved and we will be proactive and not reactive, so we have analyzed CT and MRI services. We have outlined and prioritized areas for further improvement, and you can make a difference. Question 28. You hear a pharmacist talking to a doctor regarding a patient's medication. Now read the question. Hi, Dr. Marcy. Is this a good time? I need two minutes to discuss about Mrs. Samuel. I'm Harper and I'm providing pharmacy coverage to the unit. I have a few minutes. What's up? Nursing raised a concern from rounds this morning. The situation is that Mrs. Samuel's pain isn't being well controlled. She's sedated, which is having an impact on her participation in therapies and she's continually reporting her pain at 8 out of 10. Okay. What's the background of the patient? She has fallen three times since her admission to rehab and she's requesting to go home at her first pass this weekend, some big family anniversary. But my assessment is that we are not adequately controlling her pain and what we're giving her is contributing to these falls. Okay, so what do you recommend? Well, after reviewing her chart, I'm considering lowering her dose of opiates and introducing an anti-inflammatory which would be less sedating and she should be able to tolerate. Yeah, that makes sense. Her husband is coming in this Tuesday at 9 a.m. If you're available, we could meet to discuss. Okay, sounds like a good plan. Let's meet back here and we'll talk to the family together.
Now look at question 29. You hear an optometrist talking to a patient. Now read the question. Mrs. Wilfred, what brings you here today? I am having trouble with my vision. I can't see and I need new contacts. Okay, are you having trouble seeing up close or far away? I can't see anything. I'm night blind and my eye is very itchy now. I brought my glasses with me and I want you to check them. Okay, let me check your glasses. I will show you some lenses and just tell me if one of these lenses makes these letters look better. These aren't working. Okay, now I'm going to check the health of your eyes. It looks like you have a detached retina and contacts will not help in this situation. You need a surgery. Can I get glasses instead? No mom, the problem that you are having now will not improve by using glasses. Can you give me some drops for few months? No mom. Drops will not help with your detached retina. Question 30. You hear a podiatrist talking about a proposal to offer help with dialysis patients' foot care. Now read the question. For the last couple of years, we were aware that a lot of the patients who underwent dialysis were at really high risk of developing complications with their feet, especially the diabetic patients. We found that a lot of them were struggling to attend our clinics and access the service. We had to come up with an ingenuity project to try and improve an element of care, and we thought this was a brilliant opportunity to look at the problem that we already identified and see if we could come up with a solution for it. So, we are offering our service to the people who would find it difficult to access our service. It would be really nice as we're making a difference to their life because they don't have to go out on their day off, and they go out three mornings a week, and when it's freezing cold. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear a psychiatrist called Dr. Anthony Gibbons giving a presentation about the role of case stories in medicine. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Hello, my name's Anthony Gibbons. I'm a clinical psychiatrist and published author. I'd like to talk about something that's relevant to all medical professionals, the use of narratives in medicine. Let me begin with a case study sent to me by a colleague who shares my interest in the subject. The study featured a 30-year-old man who was hospitalised for severe panic attacks. He was treated with narcoanalysis, but, feeling no relief, turned to alcohol and endured years of depression and social isolation. Four decades later, he was back in the psychiatric system, but for the first time he was prescribed the antidepressant Zoloft. Six weeks later, he was discharged because the panic attacks and depression had disappeared. He lived a full life until his death 19 years later. If the narrative was striking, it was even more so for its inclusion in a medical journal. Repeatedly, I've been surprised by the impact that even lightly sketched case histories can have on readers. In my first book, I wrote about personality and how it might change on medication. My second was concerned with theories of intimacy. Readers, however, often used the books for a different purpose, identifying depression. Regularly, I received, and still receive, phone calls, people saying, my husband's just like X, one figure from a clinical example. Other readers wrote to say that they'd recognised themselves. Seeing that they weren't alone gave them hope. Encouragement is another benefit of case description, familiar to us in an age when everyone's writing their biography. But this isn't to say that stories are a panacea to issues inherent in treating patients, and there can be disadvantages. Consider my experience prescribing Prozac. When certain patients reported feeling better than well after receiving it, I presented these examples first in essays for psychiatrists and then in my book, where I surrounded the narrative material with accounts of research. In time, my loosely supported descriptions led others to do controlled trials that confirmed the phenomenon. But doctors hadn't waited for those controlled trials. In advance, the better-than-well hypothesis had served as a tentative fact. Treating depression, colleagues looked out for personality change, even aimed for it, even though this wasn't my intended outcome. This brings me to my next point. Often, the knowledge that informs clinical decisions emerges when you stand back from it, like an impressionist painting. What initially seems like randomly scattered information begins to come together, and what you see is the bigger picture. That's where the true worth of anecdote lies, beyond its role as illustration hypothesis builder and low-level guidance for practice, storytelling can act as a modest counterbalance to a narrow focus on data. If we rely solely on evidence, we risk moving toward a monoculture, whereby patients and their afflictions become reduced to inanimate objects, a result I'd consider unfortunate, since there are many ways to influence people for the better. It's been my hope that, while we wait for conclusive science, stories will preserve diversity in our theories of mind. My recent reading of outcome trials of antidepressants has strengthened my suspicion that the line between research and storytelling can be fuzzy. In medicine, randomised trials are rarely large enough to provide guidance on their own. Statisticians amalgamate many studies through a technique called meta-analysis. The first step of the process, deciding which data to include, colours the findings. Effectively, the numbers are narrative. Put simply, evidence-based medicine is judgement-based medicine, in which randomised trials are carefully assessed and given their due. I don't think we need to be embarrassed about this. Our substantial formal findings require integration. The danger is in pretending otherwise. I've long felt isolated in embracing the use of narratives in medicine, which is why I warm to the likelihood of narratives being used to inform future medical judgments. It would be unfortunate if medicine moved fully to squeeze the art out of its science by marginalising the narrative. Stories aren't just better at capturing the bigger picture, but the smaller picture too. I'm thinking of the article about the depressed man given the drug Zoloft. The degree of transformation in the patient was just as impressive as the length of observation. No formal research can offer a 40-year lead-in or a 19-year follow-up. Few studies report on both symptoms and social progress. 
research reduces information about many people. Narratives retain the texture of life in all its forms. We need storytelling, which is why I'll keep harping on about it until the message gets through. Extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear an interview with Dr. Craig Harrisburg talking about avoidant personality disorder. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. My name is Dr. Craig Harrisburg, and I'm a mental health professional specializing in psychiatric well-being. My topic today is personality disorders. People with avoidant personality disorder, or APD, have a lifelong pattern of extreme shyness. They also feel inadequate and are hypersensitive to rejection. APD can cause psychiatric symptoms that create serious problems with relationships and work. If you have APD, you might have difficulty interacting in social and work settings. This is because you may fear any of the following. Rejection. Disapproval. Embarrassment. Criticism. Getting to know new people. Intimate relationships. And ridicule. You may also have trouble believing that people like you. When you're sensitive to rejection and criticism, you may misinterpret neutral comments or actions as negative ones. Researchers today don't know what causes avoidant personality disorder, though there are many theories, however, about possible causes. Most professionals subscribe to a biopsychosocial model of causation, that is, the causes are likely due to biological and genetic factors, social factors, such as how a person interacts in their early development with their family and friends and other children, and psychological factors, the individual's personality and temperament, shaped by their environment and learned coping skills to deal with stress. This suggests that no single factor is responsible. Rather, it is the complex and likely intertwined nature of all three factors that are important. If a person has this personality disorder, Research suggests that there is a slightly increased risk for this disorder to be passed down to their children. There is no way to know who will develop APD. People who have the disorder are typically very shy as children. However, not every child who is shy goes on to develop the disorder. 
Likewise, not every adult who is shy has the disorder. If you have APD, your shyness most likely grew as you got older. It may have gotten to the point that you began avoiding other people and certain situations. Your doctor may refer you to a mental health professional who will ask you questions to determine if you have APD. To be diagnosed with APD, your symptoms must begin no later than early adulthood. You must also show at least four of the following characteristics. You avoid work activities that involve contact with others. This is due to fear of criticism, disapproval, or rejection. You're unwilling to get involved with other people unless you're sure they will like you. You hold back in relationships because you're afraid you'll be ridiculed or humiliated. The fear of being criticized or rejected in social situations dominates your thoughts. You hold back or completely avoid social situations because you feel inadequate. You think you're inferior to others, unappealing, and inept. You're unlikely to take part in new activities or to take personal risks because you're afraid of embarrassment. Psychotherapy is the most effective treatment for APD. Your therapist may use psychodynamic psychotherapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. The goal of therapy is to help you identify your unconscious beliefs about yourself and how others see you. It also aims to help you function better socially and at work. Psychodynamic Psychotherapy Psychodynamic therapy is a form of talk therapy. It helps you become aware of your unconscious thoughts. It can help you understand how past experiences influence your current behavior. This allows you to examine and resolve past emotional pains and conflicts. Then you can move forward with a healthier outlook about yourself and how others see you. Psychodynamic psychotherapy produces lasting results with benefits that continue after treatment. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT, is another form of talk therapy. In CBT, a therapist helps you recognize and replace unhealthy beliefs and thought processes. Your therapist will encourage you to examine and test your thoughts and beliefs to see if they have a factual basis. They'll also help you develop alternative, healthier thoughts. Medication The FDA hasn't approved any medications to treat personality disorders. However, your doctor may prescribe antidepressant medications if you have co-occurring depression or anxiety. People who don't receive treatment for APD may isolate themselves. As a result, they may develop an additional psychiatric disorder such as depression, agoraphobia, substance abuse problems. Treatment doesn't change your personality. You'll most likely always be shy and have some difficulty with social and work interactions. But treatment can improve your symptoms and help you develop the ability to relate to others. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your work.